Hi, I'm Sue Borison from Your Teen Media, and today I am with Wendy Mogul, the famous Wendy Mogul. Wendy is a clinical psychologist and a New York Times bestselling author, including her most recent book, Voice Lessons for Parents, my favorite, Blessings of a Skin Knee, um, and also Blessings of a B minus. Um, and, and we're just grateful to have you here today with us, Wendy. Thank you, Susan. Glad to be here. So the topic that we're going to talk about today is these seniors in high school and these seniors in college and the loss they're experiencing and the best way for us as parents to support them. So I'm going to start with uh, what I said to one of my kids, which was after several times of saying that's so sad, I said, um, well, at least we're healthy. And that didn't go over well at all. So can you give us some suggestions of what we can say to our kids that might be helpful? I'm going to talk about seniors in high school. Great. Because for them, from the time they could first talk and listen, they have been hearing conversations about college and that particular rite of passage. And it's been so built up and inflated and filled with steroids of joy and it's going to be the best time in your whole life. And then suddenly this was taken away from them. And two things are happening in people's homes, which is the kids are really hating their incredibly annoying parents. And at the <laughs> same time, they're feeling, oh, I'm so glad to be with my mommy and my daddy or with my mommy, whatever the situation is. And I was kind of afraid to leave home and go away, even though I was so excited about the freedom. But the fear of going away was kind of unconscious. And now it's a little bit more conscious. And I hate them even more for putting me in this dilemma, which is what they do. They look at the world around them and you become, it's kind of blame pong. You become the target. If you take it personally, or if you try to fix this, you are going to get increasingly frustrated and beat yourself up about not being able to solve it for them. Wow. I had never thought about all of all, that whole packaging of what it's like to be a senior in high school right now also because I have the lens of perspective. And so I don't remember high school being the highlight of my life or for sure that transition being so glorious. So how do I wrap my head around the emotions of my kid at this moment uh, when I have real life experience? So they have, as we know, the, they're in the period of life of the greatest anguish and ecstasy of any period of life. And we've kind of forgotten a little bit about what that's like. So high school is kind of hell these days. And college is sold as pure joy and we and freedom. And you can kiss anybody you want. Nobody's going to know about it. I was talking to my adult daughter about this interview last night. And she said, they th what they imagine is the world will be my oyster and now I'm in a cloister. <laughs> that they feel um, raring to go and at the same time frustrated about not being able to launch. Okay, so you mentioned college kids. Um, and let's go back to that same story. How are they feeling differently than the high school kids? The high school kids, I think you captured it beautifully. I feel like I would be more compassionate after hearing how you said that, but I would still struggle with trying to give them a solution. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that out there that we all have to try and do that. Um, but if we move to college kids, they're in a whole different space. So they're missing out on, if, if they have built a life in another place, they were going to have an ending to that life as they knew it right now. And that got taken from them abruptly. And it, similar to the high school kids, they were also filled with ambivalence, with 
both nostalgia and trepidation because they're leaving their college buddies and they're moving out into an unfamiliar world that is much less predictable than it was for any of us, even the youngest parents of college students. So again, filled with happy anticipation and plenty of anxiety, and then that gets taken away as well. And they get sent back to the penitentiary <laughs> that also has in it all their old stuffed animals that their parents never threw away. So again, it's that very ambivalent feeling. And what parents so often with the best of intentions try to do is sort that out for them and point out just um, to hand them a longer view, but they don't have the capacity for a longer view yet because they haven't lived very long yet. Wow. Okay, so they come into our house. Mm -hmm. They haven't been living at home. It's not expected. It's not like a summer break. Um, I want to hear that they're happy to be here and that they, as while they would rather be somewhere else, we're so lucky to be together at this moment. That's not happening. No, it isn't. So happy to be here with you, you psychotic bitch. And that other person who's in the house with us who sort of tuned out and weird himself. And it isn't about you. It's about, so the people that they love and trust the most, adolescents and young adults treat the worst. And that's their parents. It still doesn't hurt to offer the kind of guidance that you're offering. For example, at least we're all healthy, or at least we're here together, and we have a house to live in, and we have food, and no one is ill. They have to pretend they don't hear that, but they do. The last thing that we can expect from them is for them to say, Oh, mother, thank you so much much for your sage wisdom. This is a whole new way to frame this problem and I hadn't considered it. And if I didn't have the privilege of a person like you offering me guidance, I don't know what I would do. They don't say that. No, they but will never, I, never say that. But even like an abbreviated version, like, you know, we come into this with our own egos and our own goals um where our lives are disrupted immensely so it's hard to stay focused on the prize which is what we're telling our kids health and wellness and we believe that um but also a peaceful house when all these other competing um emotions are happening in the house so yes on a perfect day i might be able to take a kid yelling at me when i didn't do anything wrong but sometimes i'm super stressed Mostly you're super stressed. This is really, really hard and it's completely unfamiliar territory. And this is also a rite of passage into a completely different style of living than any of us have ever experienced. For uh, if a child is yelling at you, you can't communicate. It's just the way bickering, and I see that in the families that I'm working with now from home and from their homes, a lot of it's going on between the parents because they kind of want to spare the child from their frustration. And we really want to run our homes like a cross between a business and a and military boot camp right now. Everybody has jobs to do. There are rules of engagement. There's a certain kind of etiquette that will make things go smoothly. And they had the wonderful skill that adolescents and young adults have is they know how to gather a posse around them through all of their, like the, 
the whole web is their world right now, much more so than we know how to do, although we're figuring it out, how to have a, a Zoom happy hour, or we had, we had a, an extended family Zoom Shabbat candle lighting last Friday night with the young people and the older people, and it was lovely, but half of us didn't know what we were doing technically. They know how to do that. You don't have to be the source of comfort, perspective, and even soothing, because the more you wish to do that, the more you're setting yourself up for battles that range from bickering to really loud shouting. And I hear parents talking about that. They're surprising themselves with how angry they're getting because their nerves are frayed. We're all jittery. So are you saying like, just anticipate that we're gonna have some of those moments or are there, like I think the, the military system you describe is the way to survive right now. Like everyone has jobs, everyone participates in a way that I was never able to do when my kids were younger. Um, are you saying that that's helpful for us or we have to allow for the fact that this is just gonna be a tense time? So directly from voice lessons for parents, what happened to your voice just now and you didn't, you haven't done it the entire time we're talking. What you said is everyone has jobs, everyone's going to participate and your voice went up a whole register and your power went down. Wait, so now I'm in therapy with you. Sorry, <laughs> it's a reflex. But to have that voice in your head and realize that your tone and how reactive you are. The reason your voice went up right then is that it was a kind of pleading and a wish that, okay, honey, sweetie, I don't know whether it's your son or daughter or sons and daughters, I know you have five kids. Um, could everybody please have a job? And could everybody please speak civilly to each other? No. <laughs> However, you are not going to respond to a person who's yelling at you because it's not a way to communicate that's effective. So you can say to them, we will have this conversation in a bit and everybody can take some deep breaths or take a break. We, it, this is the tricky chemistry of this time. We really want to be in the moment of each day because it's springtime. And there are tulips, and there in Southern California, we don't have tulips, but the roses just came out in my garden. And I'm really trying to appreciate those roses. At the same time, there was a wonderful Ross Chast cartoon in The New Yorker last week, and it just was terror, terror, terror. And the last one was just shuddering terror. So we have both of those things going on, and our children do as well. So I'm going to take it back. Well, first of all, I'm going to take it away from me being <laughs> in therapy, but I'm also going to take it back to the high school kids. So um, some of the events like prom fall into that category of being built up so big, but yet when you ask most people, it, it was not the night of their life. Um, so is, it, is there anything helpful about trying to reframe it for kids and say, I know you've been looking forward to this, but ask a bunch of people who went last year how fun it was? Um, it, it really is, that's kind of the, a cross between a publicist and a CIA agent. So you're trying to sell the idea that prom's not so happy, so they shouldn't be so disappointed. And the CIA agent is, I have some intel I'm going to share with you. <laughs> and instead, and I think that the chapter about teenagers in the book is called Spirit Guides in Disguise. And when I talk about teenage boys, I say, treat them as though they are an exchange student from Kazakhstan, and you're very interested in the ways of this different culture, and you're interested in being educated about it. And for the girls, it's your visiting niece from a distant state. So you don't really, she's the daughter of your, your least favorite sister. You don't care about her that much. And all of this is to insert some distance from your role as having to save them from their deep emotions, or again, as I said before, their anguish. And what we wanna learn from them is 
what are, this is the spirit guides part. What are you and your friends thinking about for Zoom prom? Or they have far better platforms than we even know about. And you're just, you're captivated, you're enchanted, you're curious, and you're naive. And that's your approach towards their wonderful creativity and ballast for keeping this ship from sinking. And you're an observer, an appreciative observer, rather than a problem solver. It's 